And then you may ask me, but this is a six. Is it two with other proteins as well? The answer is yes. This is another pro protein, completely different, HIV-1 protease. And what you see here in blue are positively charged residues, lysines and arginines that interact with negatively charged ions. What you see in cyan are positively charged residues that do not interact with negatively charged ions. That's due to the overall distribution of charges. And the same is true for negative residues. I'm getting closer to the end and want to speak with you about something else, about statistics. We wanted to know how do, do cations, cations interact with proteins. And I've been looking at structures of proteins from the protein data bank. And this was to identify, for example, if lithium ions can really bind to proteins. And I found out that yes, this is the distance and this is the probability to have an ion at this distance. When you have crystal structures of proteins with ions and the ions are relatively close to oppositely charged residues. So they all have quite simple distributions where the ions prefer to be very close to the protein surface. This is lithium, this is sodium. You can get it very close or separated by one water molecule. This is potassium, the same. And then we have uh, wider distributions for cesium and rubidium. For rubidium, we don't know exactly if this is true. We have three peaks here because we have just a few structures of proteins with rubidium. What happens with anions? More or less the same. Chloride, which is smaller, tends to get close to the protein surface. And then we have bromine and iodine a little bit further. But all of them are quite happy close to the protein surface. What about the residues? Here it's becoming more interesting. You would think that aspartate and glutamate having the same chemical group that interacts with ion, carboxylates, they will bind ions in the same way. But that's not true. Alkali ions bind better to aspartate, as you see here, than to glutamate, and much worse to most of the other residues. And again, rubidium is a bit special, but I think it's uh, more that the statistical significance here is very low. So they all prefer this aspartate to glutamate. And that's not because aspartate is more prevalent in the protein structures. No, it's the contrary. You have more glutamates. But still, the ions prefer aspartate. And I try to see if I can calculate uh, interactions between a single aspartate and a glutamate, do it very carefully with quantum mechanics. But they are the same. So there is something else there. There are interactions with other residues that are nearby, that are close to the aspartate or glutamate that leads to this difference between aspartate and glutamate with respect to the binding of ions. And then what about halogen ions? They are very strange. So chlorine prefers arginine to lysine. And then it likes all polar residues more or less the same. Bromide binds to arginine more or less the same like serine. And it prefers arginine to lysine. And iodine binds better to arginine than to lysine and polar residues. So they are not the same. And again, I'm still unable to explain this. But this is something to consider where one looks at salts of bromide or chloride. So I'm getting close to the conclusions. What did I tell you today? I tried to convince you that the binding of ion influences the local structure at the protein surface, and that halides, such as bromine and chlorine and iodine, they bind better to arginine than to lysine, but this is different for every ion. Alkali metal ions bind better to aspartate than to glutamate. The binding of chlorides in alkali chloride salts depends on the adjunct cation, and the strength of ion binding at the protein surface depends on the concentration of salt. So this cannot explain the Hofmeister series without additional consideration. 
So it's not just interactions with the water, and it's not only due to the strength of interactions with the protein surface. We have additional considerations that we have to think about when we try to explain the Hofmeister series, and that's still a puzzling, a puzzle to us. And then we show that ion binds to specific surface residues under physiological sound concentrations, and this probably affects biochemistry, but we are not sure how it affects biochemistry exactly. So not all glutamates and aspartates are equal with respect to binding of ions. We have a few reference to, references to this work. And final words that I want to say is that we have so far discussed only the binding of halides and alkali ions. But of course, proteins interact with many other ions, such as zinc. And that's very interesting, especially if you want to study how zinc actually loses its solvation shell and binds to proteins and affects their folding. But that's very, very challenging because we actually are not able to calculate the strengths of these interactions using simplifications at a quantum mechanical level. They are not accurate if you study them with DFT, density functional theory, for example. So we have to find better methods to do it. And with this, let me thank you all for your attention and Julio for inviting me here. And let me take my co-workers at uh, Tel Aviv and uh, Uppsala in Sweden and the Linnaeus University in Sweden, the funding, and again, thank you for your kind attention, and I will be very happy to take questions. Please, I have one simple question. The games of this type are radically the same. The? Chemistry. The chemistry. So, does the size is important for the binding with the protein, of the, this metal with the protein? That's exactly, that's exactly the case. So if you look at the, the chemistry, their properties are quite similar, but the size plays a very important effect because it also means that the protein has a more condensed charge or a more smeared charge. The, sorry, the ion, not the protein. The ion, of course. Now, it's even more pronounced when you speak about halides because they are, to begin with, bigger, and then all of these alkali ions, they have more or less spherical shape. But halides, they can be polarizable, especially iodine. So the shape of the um, electron cloud is not always spherical. And that also plays a role. The chemistry of iodine is a little bit more different to the chemistry of chloride than uh, if we compare alkali cations. That's one thing. I never mentioned fluor. But fluor is very, very different. When I was an undergraduate stu student, we had a teacher that was 80, taught us organic chemistry, and he uh, smoked all the time, needed to take a break, always run out of class to smoke. And he would say, the chemistry of fluor is not something that a normal human being would deal with. So this is a bit uh, different for fluor. But uh, for the rest, it depends on the size and polarizability. And another question. Why did you lose, if you understood, the first polarization spell of these metals? Again? For your calculation, for its fall, lithium, you yes. polarization number four. Four yes. of water. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't. You lose just four and not the total that would be much bigger. I didn't use four. I put ions in water and let the water organize as they see fit according to the size and the potential. Four water molecules bound to the ion. So that was not an input, that was the output. Um, very nice talk. Glad to hear some of our observations. I would like to discuss with you about the radio distribution function. That would be this. 
As an observation, I don't know how the normalization of the curve is done from max because some of the case, the normalization depends on the volume of the box. If you want to compare the amplitude of two different things, you have to make sure that the volume is about the same. For quite the amplitude, you change if you change the volume of the box. That's very right. It gets to very close to one. And it's probably better if you do this in constant volume and not in constant pressure. But the differences uh, at the volume level are uh, very small anyway. It's uh, the difference. We did a simulation at under constant pressure. And the difference in volume are just a couple of percent here or there. So the effect is not so great. In, in, in all the calculations? In all the calculations, yes. You have some more. Uh, about to discuss about the, the, the fact that EFT is not as useful as most of the people think that the method is. Okay, I didn't say that DFT is not useful. I said that DFT had some issues with uh, these kind of uh, systems when you have ligands that are uh, biological, such, such as uh, cysteine or uh, carboxylate, interacting with the ions. And what we found out is that if we compare the results of uh, CCSDT calculations with uh, DFT, many of the functionals, they produce error on the level of uh, 15 kcal per mole. And that when, if you do it when the ions are very close to the ligand, then the error is uh, not so large. But if you take them a little bit away, then the error increases dram dramatically. Now, with proteins, you don't have crystals in equilibrium all the time. The distance between an ion and the ligand depends on all ions, and it's dynamic. It changes a little bit. It's very common that it's not an optimum. And then DFT methods would not uh, be very good. Um, one way to solve this is to use uh, DFT methods that have uh, functional forms that depend on the distance between two particles. And they indeed produce better range separated DFT functionals. They produce, we had tried just once, but one of them, and it was better. See, the, the issue is could be that the exchange potential DFT is a book of there. Well, exchange is not a local. That's right, but the difference was uh, we tried to look at the difference uh, from a physical point of view, and we found out that there was a big difference, especially in polarization. The DFT functionals, they overpolarize, and this may well be due to the exchange functional, exchange part of the functional.